psychology and psychology. Yeah. Self-selection bias. Interesting. Right, well, uh, thank you for having me here. Oh, we've already skipped down one side. Um, I know we're uh, well, running quite late, very late. So I'll try not to take up uh, too much of your time. The super, super short version is I'm Andrew Bartlett from Cardiff University. I'm interested in uh, the boundaries of science and the uh, way uh, in which uh, boundaries form around mainstream and consensus opinions in science and the way in which uh, people who are outside those boundaries or straddle those boundaries are able to interact with mainstream scientists or are not able to interact with mainstream scientists. I'm interested in the values of science um, both within the orthodoxy and outside and uh, I'm interested in talking as a sociologist talking to all of you about that. There's a slightly longer version, which I'll, uh, I'll give now, but we'll skip through as much of it as possible. So, because uh, I'm still on British time, so it's uh, half past two in the morning for me. I've never given a talk this late at night. <laughs> Sober. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so yeah, I'm, uh, I'm based at Cardiff University. Um, uh, it might actually be that uh, I've, you know, having seen how uh, packed the schedule is, I can keep you skipped though, yeah. I haven't touched anything. <laughs> it might be with how packed the schedule is that there isn't actually uh, that many opportunities to speak to people individually and sit down with the dictaphone and everything and, and talk, you know, in a structured way for, you know, four or five minutes to an hour. Um, but I'd still like to have uh, chats with people and perhaps arrange interviews for a later date through Skype or if you're in. Sort of if I'm in the same country as you at any particular time, uh, to drop in and, and uh, have, a, have a proper interview. Um, I don't know how much sociology of science anybody here knows, and one thing that people might know of, uh, because it's one of the most famous pieces of sociology of science, is something from Robert Merton, um, Merton's idea of the norms of science. Um, uh, he uh, first came up with them in a, in a paper in 1942, but this is a, this is the last recover of his book from 1973, it's a very good book, collects a lot of his essays. Um, I'll race through some of these values and I'll tell you why I'm talking about them. So you know, the first, and, and you'll probably think, well, science doesn't work that way, we just don't hang on a second. <laughs> so the first is communalism, and that's the idea that uh, scientific goods, such as uh, data and ideas, are part of the commonwealth of science, and that they ought to belong to all scientists. So there's an idea of uh, scientific virtue, which is openness over secrecy. Um, universalism is the idea that in science they should make judgments over the identity of the scientists, over their race, their nationality, or the gender. It's not the, that ideas should be considered on the basis of themselves as ideas and so on. Uh, disinterestedness, that's the idea that Science shouldn't be about the fierce defense of fiefdoms or, or financial interests and things like that, um, but should be about um, the pursuit of knowledge that people should be willing to uh, give up ideas in the face of evidence. And skepticism, or organized skepticism, is that the, uh, and this is organized because it's the, and all these are meant to be values of the community, not of a single individual, in the same way as we could describe the the uh, virtues or values of, say, a group of people united by religion or another profession or nationality. We're not saying that every single Christian or British person shares all these values. We're saying they're constitutive of the community. And this is what Merton was trying to say. So organized skepticism, the idea that it's a value or virtue of the community um, that all claims should be subject to scrutiny. There's also sometimes a, a fifth one in there that's uh, the idea that originality is also a virtue. Now, I'm guessing that most of you will be burning to say something along the lines of, but science doesn't really work like that. Um, and those are the kind of things that I'd want to talk to you about, the way in which uh, you might have encountered the ways in which the sorts of ideas, that the, the, um, the, 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 the sort of mythic virtues of science, the, uh, the virtues that science proclaims and professes for itself are not... Um, or have not been upheld in, in your experiences. But of course, Merton publishes this, 
other sociologists actually start going and spending time with scientists to find out uh, how they actually behave, what values do they actually hold. So, in the early 70s, uh, this is just one example, obviously lots of people have done work, in the early 70s, uh, Ian Mitroff uh, spent about four years attending conferences, interviewing scientists. Changed. You know, uh, <laughs> spooky action at a distance. <laughs> <laughs> um, he spent about four years in, uh, uh, visiting conferences, talking to scientists, interviewing scientists, reading papers and so on. To try and find out well, what, what sort of behaviours, what sort of virtues and values do they exhibit in practice? And he found that for every, for every norm that Merton comes up with, you can find you know, significant examples of the counter-norm being demonstrated. So you have, um, you have particularism, which is the idea that um, when making judgments about science, judgments are made on the reputation of the scientist, on the reputation of the institution, on the reputation of the journal. So people are, the idea is not being judged on a universal basis, but on the basis of where they come from. Um, particularism, uh, oh sorry, I've done that. Individualism, the idea that uh, rather than being motivated by some idea of the commonwealth of science, or the grander ideas about the you know, uh, betterment of all, all humanity, in actual fact what does motivate scientists is the pursuit of recognition, or perhaps in some cases profit. But and, and those kind of things reward secrecy over openness. Self-interestedness, very similar, that the motivating drive is individualized reward, not the good of the discipline. And organized dogmatism, that there's a virtue. There's some, if you were wanting to be a successful scientist and be successful in your, uh, maintain a successful career, then there's a virtue in organized dogmatism, the idea that you won't give way, give way to your ideas. You won't give way uh, you won't let your ideas give way in the face of evidence because you'll ruin your career. And you can actually make it, you know, if I play devil's advocate for a moment, you could even say some of these things perhaps are a necessary part of science. I want to play devil's advocate. Don't, don't lynch me. Um, in that, you know, selfishness can be a great motive. I'm not a, a Randian or a libertarian, far from it. But that selfishness and some of the, some of the less attractive aspects of, you know, Human behaviour in societies can be great motivating and productive forces. That's plain devil's advocate for a moment. But scientists, if we go back to this, the scientists, you know, I, my uh, undergraduate degree was in biology, my master's degree in human genetics. I spent, um, uh, since do, uh, my PhD in sociology and, and after has been on um, biological science in the main part. And scientists do, even if their behaviour might exhibit these kinds of things, if they've been... When you talk to them, they hold to these myths quite a lot. They think, you know, they'll, 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 um, uh, they'll, they'll express these as the virtues of science. They'll profess them. And that's actually quite an interesting word because the reason Merton was interested in science as a way of life, as a profession, and the virtues that he thought bound it together bound it into a community Whoops. and made it distinct. It's spooky action. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was great. Is, is because he saw, the, he saw professions like science, like scientists, as being a great counterweight to the two opposing, disorganizing, or two opposing forces of the 20th century. The capitalism that reduces all values to exchange values, and the communism and fascism of the mid-20th century. Um, that would smash the very values of liberal American society that Merton was interested in. He thought science was a great, science there was a great model of how society ought to operate, the sort of virtues it ought to embody and can embody even in, a, you know, in the 20th century. But he also thought that the sort of managerial professions would exhibit this kind of ethical code and uh, develop a sort of set of professional ethics like doctors would. So I think he was quite mistaken in his predictions there. I'll skip past this because this is about the changes in the 20th century that have occurred in not just in physics, and I, I exemplified there by the, you know, uh, an image from CERN, but across all sciences in general. Science is an increasingly big science thing. We involve teams of people working together. There's not the same level of intellectual or professional autonomy that people used to have. 
um, working in large teams, in multidisciplinary or interdisciplinary teams, one name on perhaps uh, tens, twenties, or even over a hundred on papers, means each scientist is now a fractional scientist, they're only taking part in a small part of the project, they cannot have a full grasp of what the project <laughs> entails, that's, that's an impossibility, but also science is a math profession. You know, since the uh, Second World War, there's been a tremendous expansion in universities, which means we produce many more, more people earn their living as research scientists, you know, year upon year upon year, and to the extent that that changes the character of the profession. So, I mean, the, the, the sort of take-out message I wanted to get to is this, was that changes in science, and something I'd like to talk to you about, I would argue produce changes in the value system of science as well. Uh, structural changes produce changes in value. I just bit marked as that. So, just I'd like to end by just saying a, a, a few more things, which is just about the project itself, um, which is, as Anson said, I'm not a physicist, um, so you might have to treat me as a semi educated layperson uh, for most of the time. But as I've been working on, I've only been doing this project uh, since the spring, uh, since late spring. Um, you know, I've been learning, picking up bits and pieces, reading more and more, speaking to more people. Um, but I'm not there to arbitrate. I'm a sociologist. I'm interested in the, the, the uh, sociological aspects of this. So I'm not trying to arbitrate on disputes in physics or say this is right and this is wrong. That's um, far beyond my business anyway. Um, uh, the second is if you do agree to be interviewed, and even if that takes place at another point, um, any extracts or, uh, that I use from the interview will be, well, not quite anonymized, but be, you'll be given a pseudonym, if, unless you're keen uh, for it to be otherwise. The reason I don't say anonymized is because if the extract involves particular details of your theories and so on, it's very difficult to uh, thoroughly sort of cleanse an extract of its identifying details. But, you know, I'd work with you to make sure that the extracts are as identifiable as you're comfortable with. Um, uh, I owe a few people in this room uh, some uh, transcripts of interviews they've done with me. Um, what I am trying to do is transcribe the interviews, return them to people so they can make comments, uh, clarifications, correct things, because I'm not really interested in the verbatim, uh, verbatim um, record of what was said. I'm actually interested in whether that uh, whether that transcript uh, accurately represents your experiences of, of um, <laughs> whether the trans whether transcript is accurate in, in meaning rather than accurate representation of the utterances on the day. Um, and the final thing is I've got some information sheets. I'll be around for all these days. I'll hand out information sheets to anybody who wants them, but they're just two sides of A4, and I'm. Hopefully, uh, we'll be better at explaining uh, my project than those two sides of A4. So, call me uh, with any concerns, any questions, volunteer to take part, to chat, anything, anything at all. Um, and now I'll let everybody get to the bar or wherever they want to go. <laughs> <laughs>